They were small. Meet the surprisingly big Chevy Aveo. They were economical. Low priced and the highest mileage car in America. They were cheap. Everybody needs a Hugo sometime. And if they made it onto this list, they definitely were. Crap. Here's a list of the top 10 worst subcompact cars that were in production between 1980 and 2005, as chosen by you. If you're new to this channel, click on the link in the description below for my channel page, where most of the cars in today's list also have their own episodes. And be sure to click the like and subscribe button. So without further delay, let's get started. Number 10. Pontiac Le Mans So some of you may be thinking, how could a classic muscle car like the Le Mans be on this list? Well, in 1988, after the fifth generation had been out of production for six years, Pontiac needed a name for its replacement of its discontinued Chevy Chevette clone, the 1000. And what better name to use on a new captive import from South Korea than a name previously used for years on a well-known yet entirely different Pontiac. The name of a famous 24-hour race near a city in France that pretty much no one from the United States can pronounce properly. Yes, the Le Mans that was imported to the U.S. in 1987 for the 1988 model year may have had a Pontiac badge, but it was built by South Korean automaker Daewoo and the car's original design was European, specifically from GM's Opel division, who also sold it in Europe as the Cadet E and the Vauxhall Belmont in the UK. In the US, Pontiac was known as GM's Excitement division, so of course the Le Mans was advertised the same way, despite having a four-cylinder engine that, even in its top-spec version for the sporty GSE trim, only made 96 horsepower. Daewoo wasn't exactly known for stellar build quality, and the Le Mans sales dropped steadily until it was dropped in 1993. Does anyone miss this car? Probably not. Number 9. Renault Le Car I suspect that anyone from France who had any interest in cars back in 1979 was likely appalled at Renault's decision to market one of their cars in the United States with the name Le Car. In France, the same car was called the Renault 5, but in America, it was the first car meant to help save American Motors, or AMC, with whom Renault started a partnership to gain a foothold in the American car market. <laughs> Small cars in the late 70s were not popular so much for their looks, but mostly for fuel economy and low price. Adobe, the sassy New Mexican import that's made out of clay. But the trade-off was small engines, with the Le Car's 1.4 liter four-cylinder being desmogged to meet American emission standards, so much so that it only made 55 horsepower. The Le Car was quirky by American car standards, but not quirky enough to dissuade some police departments from adding it to their fleets. By 1980, Renault added a four-door model, but despite the Renault 5 being one of France's best sellers, in the United States and Canada, the Le Car's poor build quality soon impacted sales, and the increased import cost led Renault to develop a new car to be built in America at AMC's Kenosha, Wisconsin plant. And what car was that? Well, it just happens to be the next car on our list. Number 8. Renault Alliance I can still remember as a kid the first time I saw a Renault Alliance in 1982, and after I learned it was being sold by a company called American Motors, I was just confused. How could a company called American Motors sell a French car? Renault Alliance, acclaimed for its smooth, comfortable ride, with sedan comfort for five and their luggage. Well, at least the Alliance was built in the U.S. at AMC's Kenosha plant that once built the infamous Pacer, the topic of my previous My Old Car episode. Alongside the two- and four-door Alliance models, on the same assembly line was the three- and five-door Renault Encore hatchback, which surprisingly didn't get enough votes to make this list. The Alliance, like the Le Car, was based on an existing Renault model, the 9. Despite its tiny 64 horsepower four-cylinder, the Alliance, along with the Encore, were not as quirky looking as the Le Car, and were initially big sellers, with well over 200,000 sold for 1984. But by the mid-80s, gas prices were falling again, and many American car buyers were going back to larger cars. Even adding a convertible and a performance GTA model, couldn't improve overall Alliance and Encore sales, which had dropped to 65,000 by 1986. This also marked the beginning of the end of the Renault-AMC partnership with Chrysler's takeover of AMC. Chrysler shut down the Alliance production in 1987 as it was competing with their own Dodge Omni and Plymouth Horizon, and Renault cars never returned. Number seven, Geo Metro. Although the Metro is only one of five models to ever be sold as a Geo, the Metro is probably the most likely car that anyone who lived through the 90s will associate with the Geo brand. Come on, man, move this thing! I can't! It's a Geo! G 
Geo was GM's import-only brand that launched in 1989 as a way to compete with other Japanese subcompacts. And GM openly admitted in their advertising for the Metro that it was Japanese built. It's Japanese built, agile, quick, low priced, and the highest mileage car in America. A clear sign that even GM knew that their own products were inferior in build quality. The Metro was designed and built by Suzuki and was sold as a Chevrolet Sprint in the US starting in 1986. Available in four body styles, including a very questionable option as a two seat convertible. The Metro which was sold in Canada as the Pontiac Firefly, its base three-cylinder made 70 horsepower, or about the same as a since-discontinued four-cylinder Chevy Chevette. Suzuki sold their own version of the same car, branded as a Swift, and even Subaru got their own version, called the Justy. By the start of the Metro's second generation in 1995, the Metro gained an optional four-cylinder, but in 1998, the Geo brand was history, and the Metro was rebranded as the Chevrolet. It was Chevy's cheapest car until its replacement in 2003 by a car which, as I'm sure is no surprise, you'll see later in this list. Number 6. Daewoo Lanos Considering that seeing any Daewoo model on US roads was relatively rare in the 90s and early 2000s, the fact that it still made this list clearly shows the reputation it still has today. You just got killed by a Daewoo Lanos, After Daewoo's joint venture with General Motors ended in 1992, Daewoo soon started the design of their first model that was not based on a GM design. The Lanos was intended for worldwide sales and was also sold in Europe, Goeiedag. Ik ben Martin Trentelman, Daewoo dealer, Egypt, and Australia, in addition to North America. In the US, poor name recognition and a small dealer network meant that many potential buyers probably didn't even know they existed. Those that did, once they found out they were built in Korea, turned off some buyers thanks to the reputation of their earlier U.S. sold model, the number 10 car on this list, the Pontiac Le Mans. So getting any respect in the U.S. was an uphill battle. <sighs> the Lanos ended production in 2002, but it wasn't the end of Daewoo's presence in the U.S., thanks to its replacement, the Kalos, which General Motors sold under a different name that you'll see later in this list. Number 5. Hyundai XL When you look at the Hyundai brand today and the reputation that their cars now have, including their own luxury sub-brand, Genesis, it's hard to believe just how far the company has come since their introduction in the United States in 1985. Hyundai launched their brand in the U.S. with just one car, the XL. Hyundai, cars that make sense. As an attempt to grab a share of the highly populated subcompact car market, models from fellow Korean automaker Daewoo hadn't reached the U.S. yet, so the American public didn't really know if Korean build quality would match the Japanese. Known as a pony in South Korea and Europe, and also for a few years in Canada, the Excel was based on a Mitsubishi, the Mirage, that had its own unique sheet metal design from Giorgetto Gigiaro, who penned many auto designs back then, including the Volkswagen Golf. Mitsubishi marketed their own version of the Excel in the US, called the Priestess, beginning in 1987. The Excel was Hyundai's only US model, and to help earn appeal with American buyers, they hired an actor that almost anyone in the US would recognize just by the voice. Fred Gwynn. The new Hyundai Excel GLS will take you on a pleasant journey. But Herman Munster couldn't improve the car's build quality, which suffered greatly. Oh, it's just beautiful. A second generation in 1989 didn't look much different and was dropped in the U.S. by 1995, replaced by the Hyundai Accent, which although didn't make this list, is still in production today. Number 4. Chevrolet Chevette. I was surprised to see a few people respond in the voting that they didn't think the Chevette belonged on this list that anyone who bought it should have known what they were getting, and maybe expected too much of it. Reclining front seats, AM radio, shift console, white striped tires, fold down rear seat, and lots of other things. For me, as my first car, and the car that launched this channel, I honestly didn't think the Chevette was all that bad. As I think many of us have a fondness for our first cars, no matter how lousy they may have been. Initially available as only a two-door hatchback, but was later offered as a four-door, the Chevette is the only car on this list that was sold by an American company and, at least for the models sold in America, was American built, although it did have an Isuzu engine. Love it, but I don't need the hatchback. How come? I've already got a trunk! <laughs> General Motors needed a hit after the embarrassment that was the Chevette's predecessor, the Vega, and so became the T-body platform, which along with the Chevette was sold as the Opel Cadet and Isuzu Gemini, and a pickup version called the Chevy 500. The name Chevette was also used in several South American countries, although in Argentina it sold as a GMC. All the other T-body cars had different sheet metal than the US version, with the exception of the Pontiac T1000, later renamed to just 1000, 
which was nearly an exact duplicate of the North American Chevy Chevette, and only existed so that Pontiac dealers could also offer a subcompact car. Chevette production in North America was over by 1987, thanks in part to Chevrolet creating its own competition with the Japanese-built Nova and Sprint. But the Chevette had managed to maintain its legacy, for better or worse, far better than the cars that replaced it. Number 3. Ford Aspire When Ford started offering the Aspire in the U.S. in 1993, the irony was likely lost on no one of what that name really meant. Ford would say it was meant for young people that were aspiring to do something better. Yet for many, it sounded like the car itself aspired to be something better. Why did you buy this crappy little car in the first place? Because you guys rammed my last one into a wall! Okay, That's why! Whatever. I was surprised that the Aspire's predecessor, the Festiva, didn't get enough votes to make it on this list, as I personally think it was a far worse car. I got broke my goose neck! Unlike the Festiva, which was a rebadged Kia Pride designed by Mazda, the Aspire was a rebadged Kia Avella, which was joint developed between Kia and Ford. Although Ford continued to use the Festiva name in other markets, in North America, the rename was likely a result of the poor reputation that Festiva gained here during its seven-year run. So Ford treated the Aspire as an all-new model, despite the Mazda four-cylinder engine and drivetrain being mostly the same as what it was in the Festiva. Kia had also launched its own model, the Sophia, around the same time the Aspire hit U.S. shores. And unlike the Kia motors we know today, the 1990s Kia pretty much had the same bad reputation for quality that future owner Hyundai had in the U.S., resulting in the Aspire only lasting until 1997. It may have aspired to greatness, but clearly never reached it. Number 2. Chevrolet Aveo Remember what I said about number 6 on this list, The Daewoo Lanos, was replaced by another car also on this list? Well, here it is the Aveo, which I had always pronounced as Avio, including in my earlier Daewoo episode, and was told by many of you that I was pronouncing it wrong. But honestly, like potato versus potato, however you pronounce it, it was one of the most reviled cars of the 2000s. In South Korea, Daewoo called this car the Kalos, which is derived from the Greek word for beautiful. Yeah, that was some overly optimistic thinking on their part, although not as much as Aveo, which is Latin for desire. Did anyone really desire this car? Oh, crikey, it's the Albanian Rosas! For GM, the Aveo represented their best option to lower their overall fuel economy average. Well, you're in the so wrong great. car! Ah! Who are you? Who are you? They still tried to market it, however unsuccessfully, as a fun little car. I got goodies! <laughs> Probably even more sad was GM's ill-fated decision in 2009 to provide Pontiac with a rebadged version called the G3. Some of you specifically voted for the G3, or its Canadian counterpart, the Wave but I grouped those votes in with the Aveo votes since they were identical, except for badging. The G3 was the fourth and last car to get one of Pontiac's G number theme names, but the numbers on the other three cars actually meant something, as they were the next generation number of the former Pontiacs they replaced. The G3 didn't replace anything. It existed solely to provide Pontiac with a subcompact car, and was the shortest model run of any Pontiac, lasting only that one year, followed by the shuttering of the entire Pontiac brand. Before I announce the number one worst subcompact car, as voted on by you, here are a few dishonorable mentions. The Pinto, Ford's other pony car, at least in name only. A car that likely wouldn't be nearly as famous, or infamous today, if it wasn't for that pesky little problem it had of tending to catch fire, if anyone happened to rear-end it. The Sophia, Kia's first attempt to sell a car in the United States just a few years before they were saved from bankruptcy thanks to their merger with Hyundai. Yeah, this, this is our side over here. Trying to stay off the curb. Yeah, good, right? Good. Like the Excel, the Sophia was generally considered as crap, which makes it all the more unbelievable that today's Kia builds cars, like the Stinger GT, which just happens to be my daily driver. The Reliant Robin, which I will admit only got one single vote, but I would have included it no matter how many votes it got, just to have an excuse to show these hilarious clips from Top Gear. <laughs> Oh no, I've crashed it. Number one, the Yugo GV. Okay, so if you made it this far on the list and hadn't seen the Yugo yet, this reveal probably isn't a surprise. Surprise! Although some may think the Yugo was the name of the manufacturer, as it was marketed as just the Yugo GV when it first arrived in the United States in 1985. The manufacturer name was Zastava, which had been building cars since 1930. Thanks to the Yugo name, everyone in America back then knew where it came from the Eastern European country of Yugoslavia. That is, at least until 1991, when the Yugoslav Wars eventually broke it up into six different countries over the following 10 years. The Yugo GV, which the GV, by the way, meant great value, 
was based on the platform of the Fiat 128 and began production in 1980, but didn't reach the U.S. until 1985. Hugo committed to building the toughest, most dependable cars a little money can buy. Marketed as the cheapest new car you could buy in America, over 141,000 were sold here during its entire run. But Yugo buyers got what they paid for, with build quality and design so poor, it's a wonder it was actually legal to be on American roads. The engine power was so weak that it made the Chevette seem sporty. Even an ill-conceived convertible model was offered for a short time. The instability in the former Yugoslavia, along with UN sanctions imposed during the war, forced Sestava to cease exports by 1992. Even if that had not happened, the likelihood of the Yugo selling in the U.S. beyond 1992 was unlikely. But today, if you can find one that still runs, it would likely be the star at any car show. I've got my foot welded to the floor, absolutely welded.